Hello, good uh, evening, everybody. My name is Annika Katner. Welcome to the Hum on Screen New Deal. I'm here to introduce um, a little ritual for you to really enjoy this online uh, experience. Um, so what I would like to invite you to do is to close all the tabs that are not related to this event and both on your phone and on your computer or whichever interface you're using. And then also um, at a later stage, um, I will invite you to make yourself truly comfortable. So to actually benefit from the advantages from being in a space of your choice, um, to maybe get comfy by putting on your favorite uh, pants that you wear to watch movies or get a little blanket, get your favorite drink or snacks or your cat, your dog, whatever your, your companion of choice is for the night. Yeah. Um, I will remind you of that. We will first do a short exercise to really center you in your own personal, physical, in a certain way, digital, ethereal sphere. And then afterwards, you have a bit of time to get yourself physically set up for the event. So um, in the very first place, I invite you to briefly get up or let's say assume a standing position and to stretch yourself a bit with me to shake off the day. So you can like shake out your legs, you can stretch out, bend a bit to the right, to the left. Also bend over, as you won't see me, but you can follow what I'm doing. And, uh, and just shake it out. Yeah, so your body is a bit more comfy after probably a long day uh, at the screen. I'm gonna put my earplugs in and um, so what you can do now is ideally have a comfortable seat um, either with your uh, feet on the floor or also you can sit in a cross leg position. We're going to do a very short guided meditation. And what is important that your, uh, your spine is reasonably straight. Yeah, so not like slouching or doing any, um, let's say, uh, yeah, like just holding a sort of uncomfortable position. Yeah, it's important that your spine is straight and the energy can move freely through your body. Mm -hmm. So um, we start with closing your eyes and, um, and so very easily you close your eyes and you focus your attention first and foremost on the presence of your body in the space where you are. So you feel the supporting surface on which you're sitting. That can be the chair, it can be the floor or a cushion. Maybe it's your couch. And then you exhale deeply and you release all tension. And again, you inhale deeply and you exhale deeply. And with each inhale and each exhale, you release all thoughts, all worries, all tensions, just for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. And again, you inhale deeply and you allow the air to move through your entire body, to reach your finger and toe tips, to permeate your entire body until the surface of your skin. So you fill yourself up with air and then you take all the tension, all that you don't need anymore. You release that throughout all the cellular membranes with the next exhale. 
And now you focus your attention on the bottom of your spine. You inhale, focusing on the bottom of your spine. And then from the bottom of your spine, you allow roots to grow to the center of the earth. And you can imagine like the roots of a tree growing into the center of the earth or luminous cables like wires beautifully connecting you to the core of our planet. And then again you inhale and you exhale. You inhale and you exhale into this network connecting to the core of the earth. Again, you inhale deeply and you exhale. And now you focus your attention on the crown of your head. The top of your head. And from there, you allow a tube or a very large wire to extend into the center of the cosmos. And don't worry knowing where that exactly is. Your unconscious part, your unconscious being knows. So just allow that tube, that wire to extend. And with your next inhale, you receive energy from the center of the cosmos. Again, you inhale and you exhale. And now you focus on your heart center. That is the center of your chest. So a little bit to the right of your physical heart. And you allow your next inhale to flow into your heart center. And with each inhale, you allow your heart center to expand. You fill your lungs fully with oxygen. And you exhale. And now, with the next inhale, you allow the energy from the center of the cosmos to run through you, through your heart center, to the bottom of your spine, into the center of the earth. Inhale and allow that energy to move through you, to flow through you, and allow all thoughts, all judgment, all things that pass through your mind, all your emotions, all the things that pass through your being, just surrender them to this flow of energy that moves through you, that connects you to the center of the cosmos, flows through you, through your heart center, through the bottom of your spine, to the center, the core of the earth. Again, inhale and visualize this energy from the center of the cosmos moving through your heart center, to the bottom of your spine, to the center of the earth. From the center of the cosmos, to the top of your head, to your heart center, the bottom of your spine, to the core of the earth. And allow in your imagination, as you see this tube of energy from the center of the cosmos, moving through you, through the network of roots, of wires to the center of the earth, 
how this network creates a sphere around you as this energy from the, from the core of the earth moves back to the center of the cosmos, creating a giant toroid. And like electricity, very subtle, very gentle, this energy circulates through you at a very high rate, too fast for our eye to see. It continuously moves through you and connects you with all living beings. It nurtures and maintains you. It connects you to the cosmos and it connects you to the earth. It is your very own sphere that you can expand from the center of your heart, around your body, into the core of the earth, into the center of the cosmos. Inhale and exhale deeply. Feel this energy flowing. And whatever you can see in front of your inner eye, allow it to be there and thank it. For it's at this very moment your personal sphere. And whenever you feel like it, when you feel, when you feel the need to connect to yourself, to center yourself in moments of stress, or simply to tune in with yourself, you can connect to the crown of your head, to your heart, to the bottom of your spine, to the core of the earth, and the center of the cosmos. Enjoy this feeling for another moment. Allow this image to enter into your visual library, your inner library of images you can use to work with yourself. And then inhale and exhale again deeply. Feel the, your body in your space. Feel the surface you're sitting on. The air that moves through your nostrils. Inhale again and exhale deeply. And then ever so slowly start moving your body. Move your fingers and toe tips a little bit. And then ever so gently open your eyes. And now take a few minutes, a few breaths to come back to the here and now. So the hmm on screen new deal can start. And as I mentioned at the beginning of um, this introduction, if you would like to get a prop, um, whatever that may be, as we said, a blanket, a cushion, a drink, uh, a companion, then uh, please do so. And uh, now Margarita will introduce the evening. Thank you for sharing your sphere with me. And enjoy. Oh, wait, sorry. I was uh, in the meditation, so I got a little bit lost and didn't turn my mic off. Uh, thank you, Annika, um, so much uh, for uh, getting this uh, program started. Um, welcome, everyone, to The Hum. For those of you who don't know, The Hum is a platform for internet cultures 
We put on events like the one we're at together tonight, and we also do research and publish dossiers related to internet and digital culture. My name is Margarita Osipian, and I put the home on together with Lillian Stoke, who's moderating the chat tonight, Marco Vessels, who's running the live stream, uh, who's, uh, who's documenting the program on Instagram for us, and Laurence Shares, who's uh, been posting a lot of uh, wonderful memes and content uh, in Instagram and our stories. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so uh, before we move into the program, I just want to give a big thank you to Annika, um, who started the program off uh, with a special introductory performance and guided meditation. Um, in her work, Annika is interested in the evolution of consciousness, the shifting perception of self-image in relation to mental problems. Uh, oh, and the underlying, oh, sorry, one second. I just lost my sound. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, uh, and the underlying forces that shape their systemic counterparts in nature, visual arts, technology, and science. Um, Annika's intervention is part of our hybrid experimentation that we've been engaging in, in the last few months. Uh, unfortunately, the hybrid forum was a bit one-sided this time, uh, but did give everyone in our audience a chance to experience Annika's work and re-engage in some of the pre-event rituals that might have gotten lost during the pandemic, ways that we can uh, turn off and transition between uh, different moments in our lives uh, rather than just uh, sort of opening, uh, closing one tab and opening another tab for an online event. Um, and our aim is to continue to experiment with hybrid programs uh, for upcoming events next year, uh, with our experiments reflecting the topics that we'll be engaging with and exploring. Um, in case you're more curious about Annika's work, Lillian's going to share uh, the link to her website in the chat, so uh, you can follow that and find out more. And for those of you who haven't been on our live stream before, or maybe it's been a while since your last home event, we have a few special features that uh, we've added over the last uh, few months. Um, one of those is the ability to gather and download all the links that get shared in the chat. Often the chat is uh, quite a busy place and we share a lot of information there. Uh, so uh, if you click on uh, show only URLs in the live stream chat, then uh, you could download all the URLs and links that were shared um, during the event and just have them saved on your computer. And um, one of our latest additions are actually new emotes for our chat. Um, and uh, if you click on the thinking emoji that's in the bottom right corner of the chat, uh, then you can uh, access those uh, those emotes. Uh, big thank you to Hoos for also animating uh, some of those for us. Um, and uh, the final thing that we did is we created a new URL uh, that you can go to. So if you want to watch the program on your computer, but maybe you want to open the chat uh, via your phone, we have like a, a little sub page that we made where you can just access the chat. And Lillian will also be sharing that with you. Uh, so as many of you know, tonight is one of our focus events uh, where we take a deep dive into a specific topic related to internet culture. And tonight's topic feels even more urgent and more prescient than ever as we move into another wave of lockdowns. Um, during the lockdowns that swept the world, um, uh, the internet became our supermarket, our school, our gym, our club, our cafe, um, and big tech reaped the benefits of these changes and transitions. While restaurants closed their doors and cultural programming halted to a standstill, the wealth and power of tech billionaires only grew. In the last year, the five tech superpowers, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook, had a combined revenue of $1.2 trillion. Um, and the pandemic accelerated many societal shifts, uh, but tonight we want to ask what impact did it have on the monopolization of big tech? This summer, Google's parent company Alphabet reported that quarterly sales and profits had surged to record highs, largely due to an increase in spending on online advertising aimed at customers who were stuck at home shopping. YouTube also saw its advertising revenue almost double from the year before to $7 billion. This was due to a rising tide of online activity in many parts around the world. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Naomi Klein introduced the concept of the Screen New Deal, uh, which is what this event is uh, named after, uh, which was a kind of pandemic shock doctrine. Um, in this uh, text that she wrote, uh, she argues that many of the concerns that were emerging about big tech and its ceaseless infiltration into all spheres of life, whether it be education, transportation, or health, were being swept under the rug. Um, 
the technological and integrated futures these companies were trying to sell us were being resold under the branding that they would help us live a pandemic proof no touch life uh, in the in the text that she wrote um, uh, Klein stated that it's a future in which our every move our every word our every relationship is trackable traceable and data mineable by unprecedented collaborations between government and tech giants so how have the last two years altered how we interact with digital technologies and what personal information we are willing to give away in the name of public health and safety? Um, these questions that I stated are just some of the ones that we're going to look into tonight. Um, and they're also the questions that we explored in our research dossier uh, that we published, um, which is called uh, uh, On the Screen New Deal. Um, and you can also find it on our website, uh, which we'll share the link to. And in this dossier, we looked back and reflected on the pandemic and how it accelerated our entanglement with and deep reliance on big tech. Um, Husa Huberecht, who you uh, just met earlier, um, examined their online behaviors and asked us to rethink the ways in which we interact on social media. Uh, for our image contribution, researchers uh, Gislinda Kalpers and Mark Bauk has traced the global humor cycle of the pandemic and how it manifested through memes. A research project they've been undertaking since last year and for which they've collected over 12,000 memes thus far. Um, we're also going to share a link to that so you can uh, also submit your own uh, memes and contribute to the research project. Um, and we also interviewed researcher Marjolein Lansing about her thoughts on contact tracing technologies, privacy and the domination of big tech. So we definitely encourage you to take a read uh, and dive a little bit deeper into this topic. So I just want to share a bit about how uh, the evening will unfold. Um, we have two speakers with us tonight. We're really happy to have them. Um, unfortunately, our third speaker, Rosa Micah, had to cancel last minute due to some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, they were going to be speaking about the interrelationship between mental health and social media, which was definitely something that was exacerbated during the pandemic and which also gained some attention in relation to the Facebook papers um, that were published, uh, particularly the link between Instagram um, and mental health and self-image. Um, and Lillian is going to also uh, share a link to, uh, to Micah's work um, if you're interested in, uh, in what they are working on. Um, and so following each speaker, we're going to have a short five-minute Q&A. And uh, then we're going to have a short break before we move into a longer panel discussion. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions um, at any point during the event. Uh, Lillian will be collecting them and will be then sharing them with me uh, so I can uh, bring them into the conversation with our speakers. Uh, so. Uh, as many of us experienced during the pandemic, our learning environments and understanding of educated shifted exponentially. Um, Dyer Hendricks is a postdoctoral researcher based at the Vrij Universiteit in Brussels, uh, whose current research project investigates the growing footprint of tech companies in the financial centers of Benelux. Tonight, he'll be taking us into the history and geography of big techification and the entanglements between COVID and the big techification of education. Uh, welcome, Dyer. Oh, wait, just unmute yourself. Uh, yes, perfect. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, let us know when you're ready, uh, and you can also share your presentation as well. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. It should be up now. Uh, give us one second. Don't see it yet. Um, let's check in with Marco. And can you, did you click on the sh uh, share screening? Uh, screen share button? Yes, perfect. Now we can see it. Is it working? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I'm, I'm still so relaxed uh, because of uh, Anika's mindfulness exercise. Um, but um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, 
I think you introduced me perfectly, so I will skip that. Um, today, I want to talk about the idea of big tech of vacation, uh, which is a notion I recently coined with my co-authors, uh, Ilka Adrians, Tobias Klinger, and Rodrigo Fernandez, uh, and reflect on the role of the state in shaping this process, um, as well as COVID boosting this process. Uh, with a focus on big tech's reach uh, into the domain of um, education. So let's start. What is big techification? Now, social scientists apply a range of concepts to make sense of the world. And in my work, uh, these have typically centered on globalization, neoliberalization, financialization. Uh, yet over the 2000s and 2010s in particular, the notion of platformization has gained uh, a lot of popularity uh, to make sense of the rampant digitization of economy and society. Uh, and we propose the idea of big techification to better understand the power dynamics shaping the wider platformization of capitalism. So big techification is really about this handful of giant tech companies uh, constituting what Jose van Dijk and her colleagues have called the infrastructural core um, of the digital universe. Sectoral platforms, in contrast, are typically built upon and around this infrastructural core. So big techification seeks to understand the processes through which uh, the infrastructural core of the digital economy has come about, um, how it spreads and is deployed across the economy and society, and how it anchors and augments its power, its own power, and also its power through or by or vis-a-vis -vis the state. So, amongst others, in this report, uh, you can find it online. It's called The Financialization of Big Tech. It was published by SOMO. It's an NGO based in Amsterdam. Uh, we tried to trace and historicize the rise of big tech, uh, culminating in what we have called the big tech ban uh, around the turn of the millennium. Uh, seeing the birth of uh, five out of seven uh, big tech companies, uh, which today uh, constitute the big tech champions league, if you will. Um, this is an image of the world's uh, 100 largest platform companies based on their market capitalization. So the number of outstanding shares and their value. Um, you can also find this in the report and you, you can see from this picture that there is about seven companies that just jump out, their bubbles are the biggest. Um, I, I can talk for hours about this image, but I, I know we, uh, we, we don't have the time. So amongst others, this image shows you that, um, you know, you, you clearly see the global might of US big techs, followed by Chinese big techs. And you can also clearly see sort of the, the big tech drought uh, in Europe. You can also see that companies like Uber and Twitter operate in a different league. Uh, both these uh, sectoral platforms uh, indeed rely on big tech's infrastructural core. Uber is primarily built on a range of Google tools, uh, whereas Twitter runs on the cloud of uh, Amazon. Um, now for China, if we, besides Tencent and Alibaba, Huawei or Huawei should be added to the list of big techs. It's not listed on the stock exchange, so we don't have market capitalization. Here. But Huawei is a major tech player and has been subject to the might of US geopolitics. Uh, it is blacklisted in the US, and as a result, Huawei cannot buy uh, TSMC chips from Taiwan. It cannot uh, use Google Android. It cannot purchase 5G modems from Qualcomm. And as a result, of potential espionage, although fringe equipment like 5G antennas of Chinese make, making uh, remain widely used across the West. Now, this is kind of the sort of the, 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 the game that defines geopolitics in the 21st century. Uh, with, with scholars speaking of the rise of digital colonialism uh, led by what you might call uh, big tech imperialism or indeed imperialisms. Um, now some, some argue that these companies will reshape the global uh, political economy, whereas others note that states will remain uh, or regain authority or 
so-called digital sovereignty over big techs and the wider digital economy. But why choose? You know, this is about political economy proper. Uh, this is not a story about tech versus states, uh, but it's rather about how these two domains, once again, uh, are forming an integrated whole. So how states govern through big tech platforms, how big tech platforms rely on states, uh, etc. Now, this, this, this notion and figure uh, is informed by some of my earlier research on fintech, which is a shorthand for financial technology, uh, driving the platformization of financial services. And I believe the state, along with the financial sector, uh, which itself is intimately entwined with state power or sovereign power, uh, these are actual domains to the extent to which big techification is unfolding. So to what extent is the red circle you see here capable to consume the other circles? Uh, how? In what ways? Uh, do we see the development of platform states? Um, are they building on the infrastructure core of big tech and so forth? Um, well, um, to show you some small examples, uh, I, I have a lot of examples, but I cannot get into detail here, but clearly um, uh, some of the critical infrastructure of states and state capabilities are moving into the cloud. Uh, you see the, the, the Pentagon it canceled the cloud contract with Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's now been handed to, uh, I think, uh, AWS or the cloud services of Amazon. Uh, you see the UK spy agencies moving their top secret material into the cloud, uh, again with Amazon. Uh, so this, this, I think, would be a clear example of uh, uh, the state uh, adopting these platform logics. Um, so, yeah. Then, if we move towards uh, the COVID era, that clearly proved to be uh, um, a booster uh, for, for example, government communication. Um, when, 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 when coronavirus uh, became a pandemic, I was trying to follow um, uh, Dutch government communication through uh, these platforms. And it was really remarkable, you know, whether through Facebook or Google, or YouTube, uh, or indeed uh, Twitter, which is, you know, which is built on Amazon uh, or on, on AWS. Uh, all of a sudden, you see the government communicating through all these uh, big, big tech platforms on what to do, or you want to have uh, proper information about COVID and what have you. So uh, this was definitely a boost uh, uh, of government communication through uh, big, big tech uh, platforms. Um, another example, you know, it, it, you know, COVID uh, equally boosted government surveillance through uh, big tech platforms. Um, and I, I, you know, it's been a long day and I really don't want to get into the utter mess and malice of the Dutch COVID strategy here. But um, I would say the threat of social exclusion through digital surveillance is, is very real. Um, and then, you know, the pandemic also allowed states to write all kinds of emergency legislation in order to amass and analyze more and more uh, data. Um, now, if we would move to um, um, the domain of uh, education, the big techification uh, of education has also been boosted by uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, these two particular articles uh, one about uh, primary education, one about uh, universities or academic education, uh, were published just before the outbreak uh, of uh, coronavirus. Uh, so it, it, it really has proved to be a booster. Um, again, it is a few US uh, uh, big techs colonizing uh, education. And as argued by, uh, again, Jose van Dijk, uh, the future of ability and accessibility of our self-generated data is a cause of great concern here uh, because due to the large dependence upon uh, digital infrastructures, the public domain is sort of becoming a, a commercial corporate domain without us, I don't know, uh, even noticing even. Um, I mean, all of a sudden we found ourselves locked in all these kinds of um, uh, apps or platforms, what have you. Um, if we talk about, for example, the University of Amsterdam, 
Uh, I'm now based at the uh, Free University Brussels, but before that I did my PhD in, uh, at the University of Amsterdam. And um, the rector was very critical about the reach and the, and the entrance of big tech into the university, you know, where employees and students are really uh, more and more reliant on all kinds of Microsoft solutions. But if big techification is such a big deal and is problematic, why move your entire uh, ICT department into the uh, AWS cloud like uh, the UVA did uh, about 10 years ago, if I'm correct? So, you know, ensuring lockdowns all forced us in, into this matrix, right? Uh, suddenly, sorry, suddenly my daughter went to school by staying at home uh, using a Chromebook and Google Meets, whereas I find myself, you know, teaching through Microsoft's MS Teams. And today I, I now have to, have to, I have to, it's, it's university policy, record my lectures via Panopto, uh, which is uh, built into Canvas, the, 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 the new Blackboard, you could say. And once again, like, like the Pentagon or MI6, these platforms are run upon uh, Amazon's AWS. So I now just have to assume, hope and pray that my lectures uh, are not subject to some government tool, uh, AI tool, uh, analyzing my teaching, uh, let alone my politics. So, you know, we have been sucked into this matrix and initiatives like, you know, Facebook's uh, metaverse uh, want to pull us in even more. Uh, long story short, you know, education is, is, is being sucked into the relentless data hunger um, exerted by these big tech companies uh, with the risk that the likes of Facebook will analyze, profile, commercialize uh, the development of children, students, and what have you. Now, obviously, obviously, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot states can do uh, to stem the reach of data hungry uh, big tech companies. Yet many ongoing regulatory initiatives uh, underway, currently on the way, are feeding the data hunger of states themselves. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, legislation uh, is currently in the making that will enable the sharing of data across public and private parties. Uh, and currently this involves uh, financial institutions, uh, the healthcare sector, uh, but the law uh, also allows the state to very discretionally broaden its scale and its scope. So the risk uh, is that all these data sources uh, all become tied with each other uh, under the auspices of a platform surveillance state, uh, increasingly governing through tech and increasingly governing through uh, big tech uh, companies. Now, if we just, just think through uh, all the possible kind of you know, implications of this development, uh, if we couple educational data uh, and, 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 and educational development uh, with, you know, genomic sequencing initiatives in healthcare, um, you know, and, and, you know, imagine that we build some kind of, you know, self-learning AI on top to monitor discipline and, and possibly, you know, uh, modify a behavior, uh, uh, you know, uh, in people. I mean, at present, this is not where we are, but um, particularly since COVID, this does seem uh, the direction where we are heading. But even if we leave the dystopian prospects of, um, of, of, of big techification and mass surveillance, you know, aside in times of COVID, the impact of rampant digitization upon education is profound, uh, with younger generations native to big tech adopting and internalizing its logic and its rule uh, and thereby re rewiring or rewriting the, the ways in which we interact. Uh, and I think this is, you know, fundamentally, this is what big techification entails. It's, you know, rebooting the means of social exchange, uh, broadly defined. Uh, it's like, it works like a filter overlaying economy and society. And, you know, where once we interacted anal analog, and now we are interacting digital. Uh, like we're doing now. I was supposed to be in Amsterdam at Felix Meritus, but now I'm just, you know, interacting through this freaking matrix. Um, but likewise, uh, offering education through platforms is radically uh, reshaping the art of teaching um, by itself. You know, online face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and discussions make way for a kind of, you know, unilateral messaging. Uh, seeing teachers steadily turn into very expensive uh, streaming providers, 
uh, or, or uh, you know, I feel like a broadcaster. I, I taught through MS Teams. I thought it was, you know, the first time I taught through MS Teams, I thought it was very dystopian and I I almost had to cry when, once I was finished. I, I thought, you know, you know, to put it bluntly, what the fuck is this? It was really, really very different, uh, alienating experience, to be honest. Um, so to my mind, to, to conclude, um, we not only have to stay away from big techification and, and you know, rampant data-driven surveillance, uh, uh, but we also need to radically rethink the social uh, and societal benefits and costs of, uh, of digitization altogether. And for one, I strongly believe that, you know, a laptop uh, is not a school. Uh, it's also not a university. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your talk. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of us uh, also felt the pain of, um, of having to do a lot of things online. Uh, Oh, wait, did I lose you? Hmm. One, give me one second. Uh, I think I lost the liar. Wait. Ah, you're back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I disappeared for a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you had a bit, uh, a bit too much of uh, online presence. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. And we'll uh, we'll do five minutes of a short Q and A um, now. Um, so if uh, those of you who are watching have a question, please send it through to Lillian in the chat. Um, to keep in mind, there's a bit of a delay between the live stream um, and uh, and what you're seeing. So. Uh, uh, send your questions quick or else uh, they're not going to um, get here on time. Um, but I did a question for you because there was uh, the image, the second image, I believe, that you showed that you said you could talk about for hours. I was wondering if there was um, a URL or a place where we could also uh, see it. Yes, that, yeah, it's all, um, it's uh, it's this SOMO report. Um, shall I send the link in the in the Discord? Is that helpful? Yeah, and then uh, I can, uh, and then Lillian can then share it with uh, with everyone who's uh, who's watching online. That would be great. Yeah. Um, okay, so there was also already a question from the audience um, uh, from Liev, uh, with, who was asking, "How about Airbnb? Uh, why was it not on the map with the circles that you showed? Uh, the map that uh, we were just talking about." Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, Airbnb um, is it not? I'm, I think it's on the map. I'm not sure, but Airbnb is like Twitter or Uber in the sense that these are kind of sectoral uh, platforms, um, and they're very they're very dominant and they're they're quite big, but they still build on the core infrastructure provided by these big five American big techs or in the case of China, of two or three major uh, Chinese big tech firms. So, you know, the idea of big techification really tries to separate um, all the platforms out there, among which Airbnb is obviously a dominant player uh, mm -hmm. within, the, um, within, you know, the real estate sector or in the area of housing. But I don't think it would constitute uh, a clear big tech company. It doesn't have the market mm -hmm. capitalization to do that. And I think Airbnb also relies extensively on, on, a, on a range of Google tools. And, and maybe it, it, it also runs on, on Azure of Microsoft, on the cloud of AWS, what have you. So there's a difference there. That's what we try to distill. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a question of our own. Uh, so uh, my colleague Lillian, who uh, who you met earlier, but who's moderating the chat now, uh, was in a meeting where someone said um, that that Jitsi, uh, which is an open source conference call tool, which uh, which we have used before as well, um, 
uh, was in conversation with various educational parties to develop a privacy-friendly learning environment. Uh, but apparently this, these conversations uh, didn't amount to anything because uh, there was too little interest from educational institutions. Uh, most schools, like you mentioned, are using Microsoft Teams um, and uh, don't apparently don't have extra budget to help develop other tools. Um, and they also tend to have service contracts uh, with Microsoft. Um, and we were wondering what your thoughts were about these kinds of situations yeah I mean I think it's I think you should um, in general I'm very very supportive of uh, creating privacy friendly environments and I think that means uh, escaping the reach uh, of, of these big tech companies um, but you know that is not convenient um, Google for education is is cheap. Mm. It's almost free. Chromebooks are very cheap, and it's very convenient. Um, and you know, building or finding alternatives, it's not it's not always kind of clear for uh, people who work in education. Um, it's not always that convenient as the solutions offered by Google. Um, but um, I think. I think we honestly have to work on ways uh, and means uh, and platforms through which we can evade, you know, a rampant surveillance, rampant uh, enclosure of, you know, you know, we are, you know, looking into data uh, knowledge monopolies, basically, and who are uh, big companies who are have become like rent-seeking companies. So I mean, the, the the initiatives are very good, but the ways in which we get there. Um, I think we have to, you know, work better on that. You know, alternatives have become have to become more visible. I also think they have to become uh, more adopted by government and public institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have to. I also think we uh, just start 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 an ongoing discussion about this because I think at the moment that it's also still lacking, despite big tech being, you know, more and more. Uh, in, in under the radar of, of regulators, but there's a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to end with one uh, one more question from the audience, um, uh, and. Uh, they're asking, uh, they're saying, uh, it sounds like first you are critical against big tech, but in the end you are totally rejecting digital education. Uh, what would be your ideal solution for a next lockdown uh, in terms of education? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'm, I am totally rejecting digital education. Um, I think that maybe follows up on my last answer, uh, but mm -hmm. I am, you know, Accepting the way things are, I am kind of critical of the ways in which, you know, digi boards and Chromebooks have just entered uh, primary schools. And um, I do think that face-to-face -face interaction, you know, didactics, one-on-one -on -one interaction is very important. And mm -hmm. from that end, I am maybe, maybe a bit too much suspicious of, 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 of digital education, but... Uh, Particularly in this time, I'm, I'm and, and seeing my own kids, you know, interact in this environment. I've become, yeah, yeah, uh, very critical, a bit too critical. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's there's benefits to this education, computing power, whatever. But um, yeah, I don't think, especially for for, for small children, uh, digitization, yeah. Might as well wait a little bit, you know. First, we arrive. But that's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. This is not. This is not something I study or you know investigate. Oh, and then, do you have a suggestion for how? Uh, this is probably a huge question, of course, but uh, a suggestion for how we would deal with this. I mean, now we're again in another lockdown. Uh, here we are again, uh, like you said, in the, these little boxes um, instead of being physically together, like we were supposed to be. Um, yeah, yeah. Th th then we have to find alternatives. So we have to find uh, ideally, you know, open source kind of solutions which we can all use. We have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, think of new, uh, new ways in which we manage and collect and uh, deal with data, uh, the ownership of data. 
are they are they just you know the property of these these big tech companies? I think mm -hmm. we we should you know think if you're a liberal, you should think about you know if the, is this your individual ownership or if we maybe we can work on collectives, on syndicates, on public ownership of these kind of things. Uh, I think these these are very crucial. I think also that you know the collection of data can also be uh, geared towards more meaningful societal uh, ends, uh, as we are mm -hmm. doing now. Um, but then again, I, the, the, the states in particular play a crucial role to also, you know, a lot of these 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 these, these platforms, you know, they, they they work on you know scale ups and on network effects. So I think the state plays a crucial role here to um, advance. Uh, certain certain platforms over others and that is certain i would i would think open source solutions against the, the enclosure of, of 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 these big tech monopolies mm -hmm. so and that would be environments where i would be very much more comfortable uh, than than the way which you know google for education works for example yeah Great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll uh, we'll pr bring you back in for uh, the conversation uh, later on. Um, but uh, thank you for your talk, and uh, we're going to move uh, to our uh, second speaker. Um, so one of the other questions uh, that we felt was uh, really important to engage with was about how our relations um, to data privacy, particularly in relation to our personal health information, have shifted during the pandemic. Um, so our uh, next speaker is Dr. Melanie uh, Ribak, who's the CEO and co-founder of Radically Open Security, uh, which is the world's first nonprofit computer security consultancy company. Um, the company was contracted by the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport to peer review the Dutch cryptographic framework and perform a code review um, and pen test on the Krona Melder back end code. Um, Melni uh, is here to join us uh, to talk about uh, their work on the Krona Melder app and the technical and ethical trade-offs of contact tracing apps um, and uh, things that uh, like the Krona passport which we have come to know. Um, thank you, Melanie. Uh, whenever you're ready, uh, you can start. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting year. <laughs> I mean, for all of us, of course, uh, but also for us uh, as a security company, I would say uh, very much so. Uh, sadly, we're, I think, in one of the industries that's actually benefited from the pandemic, <laughs> uh, just due to the sheer fact that so much uh, is going online now that, uh, well, yeah, I mean, of course, with the digital digitalization of life, uh, well, everything needs a security audit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and sort of what we saw throughout the course of this pandemic, you know, the first few months, uh, just everyone was distracted, <laughs> uh, you know, but eventually, you know, people got their uh, teleconferencing solutions up and people got their uh, their uh, VPNs uh, running. And uh, really, it started, we started getting a flood <laughs> from all over of uh, new uh, requests for security audits uh, for all of this uh, new infrastructure uh, that was getting put online. Of course, uh, you know, also in this time, uh, you know, we have done uh, some amount of work with uh, with governments. I mean, as uh, as as you mentioned, uh, Margarita, <laughs> you know, we also have uh, done some work indeed with the uh, Dutch Ministry of Health uh, on the Corona Melder. Uh, we also have done uh, a fair amount of work with the European Commission uh, on something called the uh, review facility. Uh, which is basically kind of like an emergency tech review uh, facility that we've been using uh, both for contact tracing uh, technologies, but also now with the uh, with the DCC, uh, basically with the European uh, digital uh, vaccination passport. Um, we have been supplying uh, audits. We've also been tasked uh, to look into the uh, uh, EFGS, the European Framework uh, Gateway Service, as well as the Google Apple Exposure Notification API. So uh, it's been really cool, of course, you know, uh, being in the position where we are asked to do these kinds of audits. Uh, but at the same time, it's just been a weird year. <laughs> so um, let's start at the beginning. You know, it really sort of started with this uh, with the contact tracing. Uh, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it sort of seems like uh, seems like uh, after the whole big fuss of the, of the introduction of these contact tracing apps, it seems like suddenly they've disappeared, right? <laughs> 
uh, of course, I think, uh, you know, tens of millions uh, was put into this technology. Um, Bruce Schneier uh, had actually put it uh, really well when he called it do something itis. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, uh, you have a, a political situation, you have leaders, they need to do something. And truthfully, it is sometimes easier building a nice, shiny, sexy piece of technology <laughs> uh, than it is uh, to actually, um, well, tackle some of the root causes uh, of the problem. Uh, you know, at the time with the uh, with the, these contact tracing apps, I mean, of course, we were also in a situation where there were not enough ventilators uh, to go around. I mean, even now we're still in a situation where there's not enough hospital uh, personnel. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, the uh, ministries of health are building, you know, almost like immense hacker spaces <laughs> at this time, <laughs> uh, which uh, are, are not cheap. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we need to be asking whether or not uh, any of this technology is, uh, is really effective. So um, really with the uh, Corona Melder, you know, with contact tracing, digital contact tracing technology in general, the whole intention was to digitalize what used to be an analog process. <laughs> so contact tracing as a whole, it used to be humans that would uh, talk to people. <laughs> and uh, of course it was, a, it was a voluntary process. Of course it was also a time consuming process, but uh, yeah, I mean, and of course though with, with the pandemic now we're in situations where, you know, we're surrounded by strangers all the time. We're taking public transits and we basically just figured that if we can have uh, pseudo anonymous beacons that are coming off of our telephone, then uh, of of course, the other phones uh, can sort of pick up uh, these uh, these beacons, and then of course there is a uh, list that we can compare these things to. And uh, if it, basically, if if we compare it, it's on the list. Then uh, our we can get a uh, notification from our phone that you were in contact with someone who was infected. Um, of course. Uh, there was quite a bit of uh, architectural work done uh, for the security and the privacy of these apps. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, like every piece of technology, uh, <laughs> well, you sort of need to ask how effective is this? Some of the problems really uh, primarily were in things like false positives and false negatives. Um, not too surprising <laughs> as you have with those kinds of monitoring technology. But uh, for example, things like, let's say I was sitting in an office and uh, there was a, a wall between me and somebody who was infected. <laughs> of course, uh, the radio waves uh, go through this wall. I get this uh, this false uh, false positive, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it turns out that I'm actually not infected. However, uh, I get this you know, report from my cell phone. You also have to ask, of course, you know, with these with these things, you know, how many times do people need to get this kind of false positive, and then they run to the uh, uh, the GGD uh, to get themselves tested? And, you know, how many times do they have to follow this? process and, and not be positive before they're just going to completely start ignoring uh, any of these notifications uh, that are happening anyway. So, yeah, so these false positives are a huge problem. Uh, of course, other things are uh, false negatives. Uh, I mean, even just things like uh, Faraday cages, you know, and, and and just shielding your phones. I mean, we're reliant, of course, on antennas, even just putting your hand in the wrong place, <laughs> you know, uh, on your cell phone uh, can wind up uh, blocking uh, radio waves. And the other thing also is that uh, with many of these contact tracing apps, they're giving you this, you know, when they're running, it's like, you know, the this 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 contact tracing app is running you know you are protected but of course this is giving people a false sense of security <laughs> because you know quite simply we'll actually know they're not protected <laughs> but <laughs> you know so you know these kinds of problems i mean all kinds of other problems uh as well uh even though these uh beacons are uh are basically uh, pseudo anonymized. I mean, there's also other kinds of attacks uh, that you can do on them. Things like uh, what they call the uh, the paparazzi attack. So, like, let's say that uh, I'm waiting outside of, uh, you know, uh, 
Margareta's uh, house, you know, and uh, <laughs> it turns out that I'm just like sitting there listening to the uh, the beacons that are basically coming uh, coming from from that house, you know, because I, I know that I'm physically in proximity of him. I know that these pseudo anonymous beacons are actually coming from him, which means that I can continuously check that also against the list. And if I at, at some point uh, it's on the list, then I can publish in the paper, hey, Margareta has uh, has COVID, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, hence being called paparazzi. I mean, it's the same thing also. So you could do it with, uh, you know, some, some, yeah, film stars <laughs> or, or whoever. And of course, uh, this is the kind of stuff that can uh, easily get into the tabloids. So, you know, there are uh, quite some amount of uh, attacks that you can do with this system. Uh, not to mention just like all the fun and mayhem that you can also have with it. Uh, I mean, for example, you can self-report as being infected and then you can take your cell phone, tie it to your dog and let it run around the park. <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> you know, and <laughs> you know, I, I mean, but we're, we're really, you know, but the other problem also is that uh, this system is only as effective as the number of people who actually use it. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think with the actual deployment statistics that it got much higher than probably what, 30, 40 percent. Uh, I think of people uh, who, who actually installed and were actively using this app. I'm sure many of the people who installed it at this point have probably deactivated it <laughs> or otherwise uh, removed it again from their phones. Uh, and the problem is that uh, basically take that percentage uh, and then uh, basically, uh, well, uh, you know, m multiply it by the power, <laughs> multiply it by yourself. And that's basically the percentage uh, that you're going to have of the total population, essentially, or, or I should say the, the amount of matches. <laughs> Um, at a certain point, if the percentage that's using it is small enough, then you're going to wind up missing <laughs> almost the entire rest of the population that isn't running the app on their cell phone. So it's not even necessarily the, a problem so much with the technology itself <laughs> as much as it is a problem with the adoption of the technology. You know, and if we've learned anything uh, during the pandemic, it is that People are not all that eager <laughs> to adopt uh, what the government is giving us. I mean, you know, if everyone were to use it, <laughs> of course, these percentages would go up. But I mean, you can say the same thing now also for the vaccines, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> again, we're releasing sort of more solutions for people. The solutions can be there, but it, we're actually requiring the willingness of people <laughs> to uh, to go along with this. And as long as people are not willing, <laughs> then these solutions are not necessarily going to solve our problem. But again, the problem is that what else is there, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, and because technology is so easy, and that's really what it is, Te building new technology is one of the easiest things to do compared to dealing with the real political issues, <laughs> you know, that are required to do things like better fund uh, our hospitals. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, Big tech, of course, uh, is also an issue with all of this. I mean, you have uh, Google Apple exposure notification uh, API. You know, they promised that this technology would be opt in, uh, you know, also with the uh, with the contact tracing technology. The apps themselves uh, were opt in, but the Google Apple exposure notification API is not. I mean, that's essentially it was pushed uh, silently and in, in an operating systems update that most certainly was not opt in. <laughs> and uh, once you have it, uh, I'm actually not aware of any way to get rid of it, <laughs> you know, besides just using, uh, you know, an old cell phone that doesn't support it or, or a cell phone with a different operating system. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, because it's using big tech, it means that those who are using, you know, alternate uh, cell phone OSs also cannot participate in the system, <laughs> uh, which is also uh, inherently unfair. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, so the situation is that you've got this code and it's built, uh, it, it's in the Bluetooth uh, uh, you know, a lot of this also is in basically the Google Play um, code that's uh, essentially, you know, some of the services right in the heart of your Android. And the problem with this is it's a huge monolithic code base, <laughs> and it's also tied to a whole lot of other pieces of functionality of your phone. So also what's happening here is it's also really greatly expanding the attack surface. 
uh, on your phone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, of course, also is uh, is causing other problems because all of this is basically coming together with uh, with Bluetooth <laughs> and, uh, and again, going through Google Play. And the problem is that uh, if anyone is able to exploit uh, something in this Google Apple, uh, you know, uh, code, then, you know, this can also tie together to all other kinds of software uh, on your phone that also can do weather and social media and, you know, different kinds of marketing and, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the other problem is it's been really, really difficult trying to get this stuff decently security tested. Um, I can also say this as somebody who has been working with the European Commission in trying <laughs> to get <laughs> this stuff properly security tested. Um, I should probably be a little bit careful in how much I say, but what I can say is that it has been really difficult, honestly, in getting Google and Apple to cooperate. Here's the thing, you know, as, as a pen testing company, uh, hacking is illegal, right? <laughs> you know, we need a pen testing waiver in order to be able to properly test something. Now, you know, this waiver, we call it a, a get out of jail free card, <laughs> you know, in, uh, in in pen testing lingo. We basically need this to be signed by companies like Google and Apple in order to be able to do a proper audit. They have, quote unquote, released open source code into GitHub. However, you know, looking at it, it wasn't so much that they had released the code as much as they had released snippets of pseudocode that roughly approximate what it does. But not exactly. <laughs> you know, we've also been studying uh, the behavior of the apps and uh, compared it to some of these snippets of pseudocode uh, that were in GitHub. And sure enough, uh, we're seeing different behavior <laughs> uh, in uh, what's being published versus the actual behavior of what's going on in the apps live that we're seeing on the phones. But of course, to really get to the bottom of it, we need to reverse engineer it. One problem that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, which then sort of puts us into a really interesting situation that, gee, we're trying to get Google and Apple to sign pen test waivers, but uh, gee, they have to talk to their management. Hmm, gee, this is taking months. Hmm, yeah. yeah. Mind you, this audit is being commissioned by the European Commission, right? <laughs> if anyone should be able to say to Google and Apple, audit this, please, <laughs> you know, it should be the EC. Um, but, you know, political concerns, you know, the EC also has to protect their good relationships, you know, with, uh, with the big tech uh, companies, you know, we don't want to push too hard. You know, uh, we get the answer back, we have to go through, uh, you know, responsible disclosure uh, programs, you know, then we have to talk to the management, more delays, you know, at a certain point, it sort of starts getting uh, delayed so much that by the time, you know, we even get close to uh, being allowed to audit the code, almost nobody's using the app anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I mean, this has been some of my, you know, experiences uh, with uh, trying to get this stuff uh, a proper audit. Um, you know, we were also uh, asked uh, by the European Commission also to have a look at the at the DCC, uh, at the European uh, COVID uh, vaccination passport stuff, and. Uh, I have to be honest, it's getting to the point now where it's starting to run up against my company's ethics policy. <laughs> you know, because we feel really privileged uh, to be in the position to be able to study this stuff. But the problem is that uh, we also have, um, you know, I don't force people in my company to do stuff, <laughs> you know, and when I start uh, posting things in our assignments channel that, hey, who wants to look at this? And a few of the people that I have that are skilled enough to do it, look at it and say, mm, nope. Because <laughs> here's the thing, you know, I mean, the Dutch Ministry of Health is uh, building up a huge collection of ethical hackers, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, I've heard recent uh, presentations uh, that they've been giving and they're making it sound like it's again, like a fun hacker space with all these bright people. It's totally true. I mean, a lot of really great hackers from the community now are uh, working for the ministry. And of course, you know, a lot, well, I mean, it has political importance, but also they're incredibly well funded. I mean, of course, since when has the Dutch Ministry of Health, you know, <laughs> gotten all the IT funding, of course, uh, since now. Uh, I have to say they've done a lot of things right. 
Um, I think one of the things that uh, the Dutch Ministry of Health did that I think was very brave and very laudable was open sourcing. Uh, things like the, uh, you know, the code uh, for the uh, for the Corona malware. Um, oftentimes, I, I, I use, honestly, that initiative spearheaded by Brenda the Winter. I use it as an example of how the government does can do things right <laughs> uh, with open source. You know, and it wasn't just the code that they uh, open sourced. Uh, they had uh, basically partnered uh, with uh, code for NL. Uh, so they basically crowdsourced that. And um, but the other thing they did that was particularly brave was they open sourced uh, the pen test reports. <laughs> and basically publish them online after the fact. That was extremely laudable. Um, the pen test report that we actually did on the Corona Melder wound up getting written up uh, by a journalist uh, from the Volkskrant, and they basically got a little bit of heat for that because <laughs> we'd found uh, some privacy issues. But I still think that that should not cover uh, up the fact that it was extremely brave of them to be, you know, publishing these pen test reports in the first place. So, I mean, anyway, credit credit where credit is due. <laughs> you know, I think it's really fantastic uh, how, you know, the ministry has been um, conducting themselves in this way. That being said, you know, I mean, I was just uh, at uh, uh, the TBX uh, conference, you know, in Utrecht, uh, you know, the conference formerly known as uh, Info Security Pintanel. Uh, they uh, had, um, you know, a fairly large stand uh, for the, um, you know, for the ministry, uh, basically there doing some hiring. I ran into some folks uh, that I knew from the hacker community and, you know, just sort of pulled them aside. And I'm just like, yeah, so, you know, about this whole QR code thing, you know, they're about to use it to uh, to stop people from working, for Google, right? <laughs> you know, and they were, you know, and the hackers were just sort of like, <laughs> you know, and, and this is the thing. I mean, honestly, I think right now that probably the same ethical discussions that are happening within radically open security are most likely also happening in the ministry itself. Because you've got a lot of really great hackers <laughs> who are really well-meaning and who really genuinely want to help. And the other thing also is this isn't a black and white issue. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that a lot of hackers really are passionate and genuinely want to stop COVID. You know, th that's that's on the one side of it. And they figure, well, if we can get behind government policy and we can help, <laughs> you know, that we can make a positive difference. But at the same time, it's an extremely fine line between, uh, you know, fighting the pandemic versus building tools of authoritarianism. You know, and it really just depends on how you're holding it. And this is a struggle right now also within my company. You know, also, you know, in, in trying to take the platform that we have with the EC and trying to figure out how we can make the greatest positive difference, you know, <laughs> trying to see if we can use some of the funding we're getting from the EC to, to you know, to, to get a decent ethics study <laughs> on this stuff, <laughs> you know, because I think that's really important, you know, and, and, and I think we need things like that to sort of serve as a counterbalance because, you know, I, too, and, you know, we are we brand ourselves as the ethical security company, and yet we too are complicit, you know, in helping to build this technology, you know, that, it, I mean, with Corona Melder, I figured, well, you know, it's sort of harmless, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and, and we want to pr prevent, you know, the privacy situation from getting too out of hand. I didn't really see a lot of issues with that. But now with the QR code, Ever since that press conference, <laughs> you know, where they were saying that uh, they might be using it to keep people out of work, you know, this is where I draw the line personally between having something be voluntary and having something be involuntary. And I think I'm not the only one. And this puts us also as techies into a really interesting position in which we need to really start looking at the roles that we're playing in all of this. You know, what is the place in history that we are going to occupy when this is all over, <laughs> you know, and it's not black and white. We want to help, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that this uh, doesn't go too far. Um, I don't think internally that we found the right balance with it yet. I mean, certainly within Radically Open Security, we've had a lot of internal ethics discussions <laughs> about it, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, we're still at this moment uh, sort of trying to decide if we're going to staff this particular job or not. You know, do you t use the place where you're standing to at least make sure it's not a security disaster? 
or do you put your foot down and say, okay, enough. We haven't decided yet. But uh, anyway, I'm going to leave it here. I think it's been about 15 minutes, but uh, but this has sort of been uh, this, this has been my uh, my struggle of the month. So uh, <laughs> I hope you found it interesting. Yes. Wow. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us this uh, also kind of inside look into these processes, because I think um, it's often difficult to understand. Um, yeah, how all these systems are working, also the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you so much. So we'll do a five minute uh, Q and A um, with you. And uh, so again, for the people who are watching uh, online, if you send your questions to the chat, then um, Lillian will send them over to me. Um, but I will uh, start uh, with a question uh, that we had for you. Um, so in the introduction, I had mentioned that uh, we had published this research dossier that was uh, uh, linked to these topics. Um, and uh, we had interviewed Marjolein Lansing um, uh, about the Googleization of health. Um, and then in the interview, uh, she had mentioned that uh, France was one of the only countries in the EU that didn't use the Google um, uh, Apple API for contract tracing. This is the one that you had been talking about. Um, and uh, in the interview, Marjolein said that um, uh, France had this debate about the dependency on big tech. They were worried that their digital sovereignty would be undermined if they would use an API facilitated by Google and Apple, so they wanted to host it themselves. That unfortunately also means that they are struggling with privacy issues because they chose a centralized storage system. That means their data is less protected, ironically, than with the Google tracing apps that use the Google Apple API. Um, that was me quoting uh, um, Marilyn, um, and also uh, the Google Apple API was also one of your concerns uh, in the report um, that uh, that radically open security made following the peer review of the Corona Melder app. So I was just curious um, uh, about your thoughts on the, on Marilyn's comment and this situation specifically. Yeah. The problem extends beyond there because uh, also the other problem was that uh, if without using the Google Apple Exposure Notification API uh, on Apple phones, it just didn't work. And the reason was basically because uh, the basically the the radio, the Bluetooth would go on standby uh, with inactivity of the phone, <laughs> and uh, basically it had to be integrated with the operating system to make sure that it would stay awake uh, when everything was else was in standby. So it was literally the situation that they had to use the Google Apple notification API, or it just quite simply wouldn't work on Apple phones. So, I mean, this was uh, the other issue that France was struggling with. And do you know if any other uh, countries had actually engaged in this uh, in this debate around uh, the use of this of this specific API? Well, I mean, the academic community had uh, come up with uh, quite a number of uh, alternatives. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in the end, I mean, I uh, this is this is a while back, so I'm trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, basically, the Google Apple Exposure Notification API was based upon one of the uh, one of the academic alternatives. Uh, basically, it was very much related uh, that came out. And indeed, uh, it used the decentralized model, whereas uh, mm -hmm. France uh, went with the uh, went the more centralized one. But um, in the end, I think it wasn't really even a conscious choice. It was more just kind of a de facto thing that happened. Um, you know, big tech stepped up, uh, and governments didn't really. I mean, it was the easiest alternative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I don't even necessarily think that it was so much a conscious choice of government as much as it was just sort of like something filled the the gap, and and they mm -hmm. took it. Um, there's a question from uh, from our audience, uh, from Mimi, um, who's asking uh, if you are even more skeptical uh, and anxious about big tech than the average person would be because you know um, a little bit of what goes on on the inside, or does it actually make you feel better since you're more aware of... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Um... I think there's good things and bad things about big, big tech. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, with companies like Google or Amazon, I mean, I, at, at least they have really great IT teams and security teams. I mean, I think that for small players like SMEs uh, that, um, 
are too small to really properly run their own IT departments or, or to have dedicated security staff. I mean, you, you would be shocked. I'm, I'm super open source friendly, but I will advise them oftentimes to go with something like Google. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. just quite simply because if you lack the technical expertise to run it yourself, don't. <laughs> you know, and of course, this is uh, quite simply because uh, if people don't keep their software up to date, you know, th then they're going to have a lot worse problems than uh, than big tech, <laughs> you know, because, of course, the number of uh, companies uh, that contact uh, radically open security with with ransomware, you know, and, and it's always the same thing. It's it's always uh, stuff that's not updated. <laughs> So, uh, you know, so, so in that sense, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're sort of juggling, uh, juggling evils here. So I think that there are some things that, that good tech is good for. And you also really need to ask yourself, what is your attacker model? <laughs> you know, for most people, probably uh, big tech, uh, you know, and the uh, intelligence ag yeah, agencies of the U.S. probably are not their attacker model. <laughs> um, you know, it's probably different if you're some kind of like a little civil society group. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, if you're doing anything of, of, of geopolitical uh, controversy or if you are even a larger company, you know, with IP or, uh, you know, a politician, I mean, then, of course, I think you need to think about uh, these kinds of uh, attacker models. But I think for the average small business person, I mean, it's it's not really the kind of thing necessarily that should even be part of their threat model, just quite simply because mm -hmm. they don't have the resources to be able to do anything about it anyway. Um, that being said, I mean, I think that uh, the real problem anyway with big tech has nothing to do with the tech itself. It's really uh, more the business models. And I've been spending an increasing amount of time lately on uh, thinking in terms of uh, nonprofit uh, business models and steward owned business models and, you know, other kinds of sort of alternative business models. I think that the problem that we're having is that uh, the startup ecosystem that we've created breeds tech monopolies. Because if you think about it, uh, if you know I'm a tech founder and I want to start a company, I go to an incubator. We know the common statistic that nine out of ten uh, startups fail. And then the whole idea is the tenth uh, that succeeds. The idea is it gets uh, gets capital, uh, oftentimes from foreign investors. It grows exponentially, and then essentially it's attempting to become a unicorn. And you can really substitute the word unicorn for uh, taxpayer subsidized monopoly forming, because that's basically what it is, <laughs> you know. And the problem is there's this echo chamber uh, in government, in um, the startup ecosystem, uh, business schools everywhere that says that unicorns are good. And I assume there's probably some artists uh, that are watching this program. Um, I, I think people need to be educated about uh, how problematic <laughs> unicorns actually are. We need to ask really nicely if Prince Constantine would stop saying that we need more unicorns in the Netherlands because we absolutely do not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what we're doing is we're building these vehicles for moving capital around rather than actually building companies for the sake of mm -hmm. having a company do something mm -hmm. useful. And anyway, I could spend a long time talking about this stuff and I won't. But uh, but but the problem with Facebook is that Mark Zuckerberg is completely unaccountable. You know, it's not that they don't have uh, enough good technologists. I mean, of course, Frances Hagen, you know, the, the whistleblower, I mean, she is an expert in algorithms. <laughs> you know, it's not a question of whether or not they can make better algorithms, you know, or that they couldn't crack open the uh, the black box of, uh, of, uh, of, of AI. I mean, you know, this isn't the problem at all. The problem is that, A, there was no escalation path within the company, <laughs> uh, you know, to be able to, to legitimately complain about uh, about things. Uh, the cho choice was actually over, you know, choosing one set of algorithms, you know, to promote uh, so-called meaningful social interactions, AKA, mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, <laughs> inflammatory content uh, for the sake of selling more ads. This was a business decision. This had nothing to do with the lack of technology to be able to do this. And this is sort of why I keep saying we need to stop staring ourselves blind at the technology. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we need to really understand that the, the problems are larger, the problems are huge Human, the problems are systemic. The problems are oftentimes business problems, you know, mm -hmm. and also Mark Zuckerberg is untouchable. 
You know, he has there's this super voting construction uh, in which Mark Zuckerberg has 10 votes for every share of stock when, when you and I only have one vote. He owns about 35 percent of the shares in Facebook and has about 60 percent of the votes. And uh, a uh, activist uh, hedge fund actually tried to fa file a uh, shareholder resolution at the Facebook AGM to change it to, for, to one share, one vote. And Mark Zuckerberg basically single handedly voted it down. Hmm. You know, there's a reason why the algorithmic experts are deciding that the most effective way to fix their company is to, to walk to the Wall Street Journal with a pile of documents. <laughs> you know, and this is this is not a decision that people make lightly. And I say also as a technologist myself, I've been working in cybersecurity for 20 years. You know, it's a really long time. And I spelled I spent a huge portion of my career building privacy enhancing technologies of all kinds, <laughs> you know, to, to protect us from from RFID, you know, to protect us from, you know, basically building a v, little VPN boxes. I mean, you know, but also working on all, all, all kinds of other things. At a certain point, I just started getting really tired of building technology band-aids for business model problems mm. you know and, and sort of as i've gotten older i've just realized that I, we need to start fighting business model problems with business model solutions because i think that's actually the mm. only thing uh that's going to help so as a result i've uh lately been spending an increasing amount of time on something that i call a uh, post-growth entrepreneurship which is really trying to see if we can reform the startup ecosystem <laughs> because the thing is you know if you keep doing things in the same way you know, it, it, expecting different results. You know, if we keep incubating mm -hmm. our startups in the same way, assuming they're not going to become the next Facebook, I mean, that is the definition of insanity. <laughs> you know, so we need to, I, you know, because, and, and the problem is, you know, the system, you know, it, I mean, a lot of it is really just extraction and business, extraction and finance mm -hmm. and the whole, you know, set, set of, regulations and structures that are set, set up to support that process that is the system and that causes all the other so-called externalities that we have in our society whether we're talking about climate change or inequality or privacy problems <laughs> or, or the data hunger it's it's all one and the same you know it's like uh, you know it's like extinction rebellion says system change not climate change mm -hmm. it's the same thing system change not privacy even because mm -hmm. you know until mm -hmm. we reform the system you know as long as we keep trying to build pets and thinking that these pets are going to get us out of it uh you know we're just we're we're chasing at windmills mm -hmm. <laughs> you know because uh you know so i think that uh you know uh, the technologists need to play a role, but but again, us technologists are also complicit, you know. And I think you know, with the computer science students, with the next generation, we are being taught that our vision of success is working for Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, whoever. I mean, we also should be teaching you know our next generation of technologists that actually they can make a startup or they can work for a social enterprise uh, or they could, you know, uh, go create a steward owned company, you know, or something where these incentive structures are different, where we can try and remove the profit motive so we can actually start using the technology for impact, positive impact. You know, I think that I think that's the way that we're going to solve the problem. So, yeah. Wow, thank you. Yes, um, it's also a lot to uh, a lot to think about. I have a quick question. Do you want to uh, take a five minute break and then move into the conversation, or are you both okay to? Uh, Raya is also here. Are you okay to uh, continue um, with the three of us now, or do you want to? Do you want five minutes to? Uh... I'm fine with continuing. But, uh... Yeah. Okay. Maybe Marco uh, can bring Ryer into the uh, live stream. Ah, great, perfect. Uh, so for uh, for those watching online, um, please feel free uh, to send questions. There was one question actually that had come in from the chat that I'm going to uh, check in. Um, okay, one second. Uh, could, could I? respond or just reflect on what Melanie told because it's just, yes please it's, it's so much as uh, reverberating with, with stuff we are uh, uh, researching I mean first about you know uh, France 
Uh, I think within within Europe and the European Union, the French are really pushing this idea of digital sovereignty. Um, and now with, with the new German government coming in, they also, at least on paper, uh, are saying that they also want to, you know, focus on digitization, move away from what you might call the fourth contratia into the fifth, so going away from automotive into into tech. Um, but the French have really been pushing this idea from from digital sovereignty. They 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 see, and I think they're right, that the anglophone world uh, is moving away from this multilateral EU of structure and having having its own kind of um, idea of new a new strategy geopolitically, uh, economically, and that has a lot to do, I think, with the big tech platforms. Um, so the French are really pushing this. Uh, the, the other point I want to make is that big tech platforms, since the uh, crisis of 2008, and since uh, uh, you know the introduction of very loose monetary policies, um, the big techs have really been capitalizing on on you know a wave of liquidity uh, to augment uh, their their market dominance and to augment their monopolies. Uh, the money spent and the, the ways in which they got into debt. Uh, over the last 10 years is staggering. They were virtually not indebted 10 years ago, and now they're carrying like a couple of hundred billion dollars in debt through which they have uh, acquired all these other companies around them and through which they have, you know, you know, uh, stabilized and sort of anchored their, their market dominance. So that's really like sort of fusion of financialized capitalism with tech uh, has, has sort of anchored their monopoly positions. So I, I just wanted to like confirm the, the report I just put into the Discord uh, on the financialization of big tech really tries to dig out how finance and and and, and the tech industry and the big techs uh, have 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 moved into the dominant monopoly positions in which they are currently operating. Right. Um, so just to, just to put some flesh on what Matt is said. Thank you. Um, this is also a bit of an extension on this, but there is a, a question from the audience from uh, Giorgio's, uh, who says, uh, can we even talk about different economic models without ma making a critique of capitalism? Um, as in, can we think companies uh, uh, to come up in a capitalist economy and not be extractive, accumulating wealth, testing limits of law and um, yeah, testing the limits of law and uh, human rights all the time. I don't think there's necessarily a conflict between capitalism and uh, behaving decently. I think the real conflict mm -hmm. is with uh, neoliberalism because, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, things like, uh, I mean, a business is nothing more than people who work together uh to try and accomplish something in a financially sustaining fashion that's it you know and also things like markets like buying and selling you know at its basis i mean that that's a completely neutral <laughs> you know and it, it's 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 simply trade and and this is something that uh you know i think we, we can really use for for pretty much everything so my problems isn't so much with uh with capitalism itself uh it's rather uh with uh sort of the sprinkling of uh, neoliberalism on top of it, of course, with the whole, uh, you know, shareholder maximization um, bit, uh, and indeed the financialization, uh, of course, uh, as, uh, as, as you were just talking about. Um, but we can get rid of this, actually. <laughs> so it's not so much, I think, that we need to overthrow capitalism, because let's face it, that's never going to happen, and it wouldn't be practical anyway, because, <laughs> I mean, you know, we do still need to specialize and to create good and ser goods and services. We need that to run a society, and I don't think any kind of disorganized anarchy is necessarily going to be any better. But rather, what I think we need to do is we need to focus on removing the extractiveness uh, the rent-seeking behavior, the usury, uh, out of uh, out of business, and and again, this is where I think nonprofit business models and and things like steward ownership uh, come in there, because I think if you can remove the profit motive from a business, then basically all that's left is the is the impact, <laughs> and and at that point, then we can really focus on solving problems, you know. And the other thing, the reason why, you know. 
I keep looking at things like the startup the ecosystem, uh, you know, uh, the very first startup incubator uh, that ever existed uh, was something called the Batavia Industrial Center in Batavia, New York. And basically what it was is uh, they had, there was an industry in town uh, that wound up leaving. So the uh, populace in that town was, uh, well, le left rather uh, poor and desperate. Uh, there was a rich family there uh, called the Minuscos and uh, they didn't want the people in that town to be too poor because of course they wanted people to eat in their restaurants and to, to watch films in their movie theater. So what they did is they had bought a, a large empty building and they had uh, decided, well, we're going to create create like a kind of little business center here and we're going to have shared facilities, things like, you know, administration and bookkeeping and, you know, copy copiers and whatever. I mean, you know, anything that people basically would need to uh, to run a business. And uh, one of the first tenants in that building was actually a uh, a chicken hatchery. And at some point uh, they uh, brought a uh, journalist through the building and, uh, you know, and the journalist basically, you know, they, they were going through the hatchery and then uh, the, uh, Joe Manusco said, well, you know, actually here they're breeding, uh, you know, they're incubating chickens. Gee, I guess we're incubating startups. <laughs> you know, this is actually where that where the term came from, <laughs> uh, you know, from this uh, from this uh, Batavia Industrial Center. Now, with BIC, their definition of success was for a entrepreneur to graduate out of the out of the BIC and onto Main Street. Because I mean, really, the whole the whole point of this incubator was to revitalize the local economy that had gotten decimated when the big industry moved out. Now, bringing this back to the modern day, if you look at what's happened with the pandemic, <laughs> you know, and and all of the lockdowns, you know. We've had all these initiatives of the government, you know, trying to re-envision, you know, what do, what does new economics for after the pandemic have to look like, <laughs> you know, and we've also had these initiatives like the, uh, you know, national reforms, you know, the National Growth Fund, uh, you know, also seeking growth plans for the Netherlands and things like this, but they're missing. Is this also points. the donut economy? Is the donut yeah. economy part of this system? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, donut is also thinking in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But but really, I mean, the point is that what we're trying to do right now is I, we're, it's not that we need more unicorns that we can then, you know, sell to uh, to foreign entities and, uh, you know, uh, thus making data governance even more problematic than it was to begin with. But what, what we actually really need, you know, is to is to revitalize our local businesses because our local businesses are who have been suffering the most throughout all of these lockdowns. Uh, in the pandemic. So I think, you know, rather than trying to fund, uh, you know, these uh, VC funds, uh, basically, that are then trying to, uh, you know, build the next generation of unicorns or, or otherwise companies uh, that we can sell uh, to foreign interests, I mean, why not <laughs> instead, you know, try and help bootstrap you know, <laughs> or, you know, or, or local companies, preferably of the kind that can, cannot be sold, <laughs> like the steward owned ones. I mean, that is what our local economy needs. But the degree to which we have sold out our cities to foreign investors, I mean, I live in Amsterdam. <laughs> you know, I mean, whether we're talking about the price of housing or we're talking about Nutella shops, I mean, you know, everything about the city, you know, that, that's getting destroyed, <laughs> you know, is because we are literally selling, we are literally selling the city, you know, to uh, to foreign foreign capital. So, but again, this is a cultural problem and, you know, cultural problems need cultural solutions. And mm -hmm. that's sort of why I hope also, you know, it starts with a discourse that starts with a dialogue, you know, and I hope that also people from, I hope we can start these discussions about it. I hope people from the cultural sector can create art about it. I mean, we need to, <laughs> you know, we, we need to spread these ideas and it's not until people really start questioning the way that we're doing things now that I think we're going to be able to take new steps towards really, uh, solving our problems. Thank you. But I, did you want to uh, maybe respond or expand on that in relation to your research? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I, I agree with a lot of what Melanie said, uh, but the how to distinguish neoliberalism and capitalism is not always obvious to me. I always think that I want to be a liberal in a way but then often sort of fucking str sorry, struggle with the ways in which monopoly comes back and back again. 
So, I mean, if we look at, you know, 21st century digital capitalism and you compare it with 19th century, like capitalism, building railroads and what have you, that was the tendency of monopoly is inherent, inherent to the system. And I think if you would say, okay, if we would have a non-profit motive, okay, that, but to, to what extent are we then still talking about capitalism, right? Because I think the profit motive is like, you know, the, the sort of the... the the, the fuel of this whole kind of system. Um, so monopoly is inherent. And I think with the big tech companies now, the logic they follow and the way in which they adopt financialized kind of logics and instruments to, to establish their monopolies and augment it, they are reminiscent of things we saw in the 19th century. You know, the way before, when Amsterdam was the, the center of the universe and it was also a, a combination of states with a with a with a, with a corporate monopoly that that enjoyed effectively state power, right? Um, so I, I'm not sure. I think I think what we're seeing now is inherent to capitalism. But then again, if we talk about neoliberalism in particular, which you know is a kind of you know a theory of state designed to advance markets or an idea of markets. I don't think big tech monopolies. Uh, really suit the idea of markets. I think they sort of control markets or offer a, a frame within which they can um, uh, uh, lubricate markets. Like Amazon is not a market. It's like a market master, if you will, um, a monopoly that shapes the market. Um, and I think that, that, that technology is sort of, uh, and big tech is driving, it's kind of forcing neoliberalism to become kind of uh, illiberal in certain ways. I'm writing, I've, I've written s some pieces on, on, on neoliberalism becoming neo-illiberalism because it, you know, particularly the tech companies are sort of, you know, forcing the right to privacy, uh, they're, they're corroding the right of privacy, they're corroding all kinds of kind of liberal values. And they're very much, they're much more collectivist than we readily kind of acknowledge, I think. I think uh, Shazana Tsubov's book, uh, book on, on surveillance capitalism, you can have a lot of critique on that. And it also struggles with neoliberalism and capitalism, um, or it makes a big distinction where more leftist people would say, well, is that really true? Um, and I think that, 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 that the, the, the tech driver in now is, uh, again, sort of, you know, challenging uh, the liberal credentials of this world and particularly now COVID over COVID is really like, 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 uh, like, um, I don't know. It's like, it, it's challenging the core premises of liberalism, your individual rights to, you know, your, 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 what is it? Bodily integrity, the right to public health care, to, 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 to health in general. Um, it's challenging all kinds of core liberal premises in a way. Um, and I also think, and, 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 and Melanie also reflected on that in their talk, we're not only dealing with ICT, we're also, the, you know, this, this is the fifth, fifth Kondratiev, you know, Kondratiev was this Marxist economist who said, you know, technology moves in like 50 year cycles where capital, you know, invests in new kind of technologies, be it textiles or be it oil and petroleum, and now it's tech. But it's not only like ICT, but it's also biotech. And biotech and COVID, you know, uh, so the, the, I, the, the, they, they, they sort of challenge. You said, you know, you want to, the hacker community wants to uh, uh, build solutions to overcome COVID, but there's a fine line between being helpful or being sort of a enabling authoritarian kind of gadgets. I think you can see this very clearly um, with COVID in general, but particularly also Sorry, the government strategy here in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's really, really tricky because on the one hand, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we tried to get Corona under control. On the other hand, they're just letting it rip and then just use the fact that we have a high circulation of COVID to introduce like 2G, to exclude people who yeah. have not been vaccinated from society in general. So there's, there's and, and, and the, pr the problem is, I mean, what they're doing doesn't even make sense. I mean, oh, it's it like doesn't. now, for now, for example, I mean, trying to uh, come up with the appropriate uh, crypto uh, to be able to revoke uh, QR codes in case somebody tests positive. I mean, assuming we can, you know, find from a computer security perspective, <laughs> be able to find the right uh, right tools with which to do this on a, on a higher level, on a human level, like what? 
you know, I, what are we doing? Because I mean, the moment that we start revoking people's QR codes, who's going to get tested? <laughs> like, what incentive are people going to have to go to, you know, go go to the uh, day and get tested if the, you know that the consequence of this is that you are going to be shut out of any semblance of a normal life for a few weeks? Yeah. I mean, you know, and, 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 and this is the problem. And it's not like the people in the ministry don't understand this <laughs> and understand that on a higher level, this doesn't make sense. But they, they, they're they civil servants. They have to do what the government is telling to them to do. I mean, you know, the problem that we have here, we've got a medical pandemic and we've got a political pandemic. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and the problem is that I think that, you know, at this point, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure which of the two is, ca- is, is causing more damage. <laughs> I'd say the political, but th- that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was also a, a, a bit of a response to uh, what you were talking about in terms of uh, also being able to uh, uh, sort of pull apart or just distinguishing between liberalism, uh, neoliberalism and capitalism. Um, Giorgios, who had asked that comment, uh, also said that the problem is that at the moment there is no other model of capitalism than the neoliberal one. Um, although I think that some of uh, maybe these, uh, the work you're doing around like uh, post-growth uh, economics and post-growth entrepreneurship, um, maybe we could also see those as uh, as models um, that we could look towards. Um, but maybe they're not, of course, the dominant models that we're integrated in. Yeah, um, yeah maybe a final question, uh, which is uh, based on a bit of a debate or conversation that's happening in the chat. Because um, uh, Mimi was saying that uh, uh, that they think there's enough knowledge and alternatives, but in their opinion, people choose for big tech uh, because everyone is on there already. It's uh, it's obviously uh, quite dominant. Um, and then uh, another uh, another person asked, like, how should we fight this mindset? Um, uh, and I think maybe this also ties back into this uh, this cultural element that uh, Melanie you had talked about as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think the problem is it's really almost impossible to avoid big tech. I mean, given Mm -hmm. the place that we're at now. I mean, you know, I am a career security professional and yes, I am on social media, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, but it's because, you know, I I, I understand full well what the trade-offs are, but at the same time, you know, also just for me as a human being, you know, I also find it appalling to know that I'm going to be completely disconnected from my family and friends or that I'm going to be completely disconnected from my professional network. <laughs> you know, I, I use LinkedIn, you know, quite a bit, <laughs> you know, to connect and, and a lot of new business for my company, you know, comes in via these kinds of channels. So. The problem is that uh, I think that to overcome these kinds of platforms, I don't think abstinence on the level of consumers is going to make the difference. I mean, it's sort of like uh, being vegetarian. You know, I mean, a lot of people abstain from eating meat because they, they you know, feel bad for animals. And I, you know, I, I applaud those people because, of course, animals are treated treated appallingly. But I think, though, that the real solutions are the, the systemic solutions. I mean, as it, I mean, sure, the meat alternatives also have their problems. But but still, you know, I mean, if you look at the sheer number of animals that beyond meat, you know, as a, as a social enterprise, you know, has managed uh, to save, you know, I. I the point is you need a company that can provide a viable alternative to enable consumers to be able to make that choice, you know, and everybody likes to say, you know, it's up to the consumer. <laughs> um, but if the choices aren't there, the, the only choice is to no longer participate in society. And that's not a choice at all, <laughs> you know, or to sacrifice uh, to the point that uh, that you're living such an ascetic life that, uh, that you're not <laughs> enjoying anything or having pleasure in, in things anymore. And that's why I keep coming back to the responsibility of of businesses you know it's the same thing with security and privacy i mean you cannot expect that end users you know that that somebody's grandma that you know that kids that i mean i mean hell even security professionals can't get it right (laughs) you know and i'll tell you (laughs) you know and we've done enough you know phishing tests on uh you know hosting providers and other really highly technical companies and i'll tell Mm -hmm. you that they claim on this 
click on all the same crap that everybody else clicks on. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, truthfully, like, you know, and I, I would, I would click on a well-crafted fishing mail, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm the director of a security company. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, really assuming that that we need to somehow put this burden, put this onus on on the uh, on the consumers is completely misguided. I mean, it, it's impossible, and and they're never going to be able to, to to handle that, even if they are fully educated. So, mm -hmm. you know, this really makes it the responsibility of the. Uh, IT departments, <laughs> you know, and also of the developers uh, at the companies that are building the technology at the first place. And this is where we keep coming back to the same business issues <laughs> because, you know, the IT departments and, and the people developing the technology, they do have the knowledge, <laughs> you know, to be able to build in all of the correct protections. And it is our responsibilities, <laughs> you know, but we need to be in a position, though, where we're enabled, <laughs> you know, and permitted and where it's prioritized for us to be able to do this, you know, and that's sort of, you know, what I think, you know, people keep wanting to replace Facebook, you know, and I've seen, you know, I mean, you, you had diaspora and you had Mastodon and I think for a while, mm -hmm. um, oh, I think somebody also had come up with some kind of a, I think Jay Abalu at a certain point had some crowdfunding campaign uh, also to, uh, I forget what it was called now, but, uh, you know, the, and the problem here is that the usual approach that we're taking is with trying to build Facebook replacements is we're trying to like assemble a huge pot of capital somehow, you know, maybe by crowdfunding or maybe with some subsidy or maybe, you know, something else. And then we've got this mad scramble to try and build this technology and scale it as quickly as possible to try and get you know um network effects before we, we run out of money <laughs> and you know it's it's an absolutely impossible task <laughs> to be able to do i mean th there's almost no amount of money that's going to enable you for to be able to go for long enough you know to, to be able to catch up with the incumbents mm -hmm. you know that that's that strategy is not going to work and that's why that's part of the reason why the, these platforms have never taken off you know they they actually don't have a business model the problem with, you know, if you want to build, you know, the next Facebook, what you actually really need to do is you need to start something, bootstrap something surface based that has customers that is viable at the smallest possible level, you know, and it can just start by doing some tiny subset of what Facebook does. I mean, don't try and replace all of Facebook. Mm -hmm. Just don't even try. You're, you're, it's not going to succeed. Just just focus on one small thing that you can do and you can do well and that people, somebody will find enough value in that they're willing to pay for it. From there, you've basically got mm -hmm. revenue, then you can put margin on the revenue, then use that organically, you know, as you grow with happy customers that become repeat happy customers to, to slowly organically grow. Because the whole, the whole thing, and this is what people don't get, is that with bootstrapping, there's no runway, <laughs> you know? Whereas when you get VC or when you get crowdfunded or you get any of these things, you know, the amount of capital divided by your burn rate is a runway. And that's how long you can keep it up until you fall mm -hmm. over. And at a certain point, they all fall over. But, you know, as long as you are cash flow positive, you can continue taking steps <laughs> forever <laughs> because, you know, that because that revenue will continue, uh, continue supporting you. And the other thing people don't get is that customer revenue compounds like interest in a bank account. I mean, back in the days when we had interest, but uh, not, nonetheless, <laughs> you know, but, but the point is that, uh, you know, I mean, if you've got one happy customer, then you get a second one, then the, the first one comes back, then you get a third, then the one and then number two comes back. Back. But mm -hmm. you, you see what I mean? And, and it, slowly and organically, at a certain point, it's actually not even that slow anymore, <laughs> you, you know, because because of this compounding effect. And, and if slowly you start incrementally uh, adding features and adding options, then you're going to start to get the users. And then gradually and slowly, the user base will come and will stay because there's some kind of a value proposition, you know, that's drawing them and that's keeping them. And if you slowly start pivoting that in the direction of a social media platform you know that that's how we're going to build the next facebook but no one you know is is, is taking this mm -hmm. kind of an organic you know bootstrapped uh, cash flow positive approach to building it 
You know, the other thing also is that we don't necessarily even need to build, quote unquote, the next Facebook. I, I think by by its very nature, if we build something as large and monolithic as Facebook, it will just become the next problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the other thing that I think we need to think about is rather than building huge tech monoliths, instead, I think we should think about building networks. <laughs> you know, build smaller organizations mm -hmm. that have, you know, that 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 have integrity by design, <laughs> you know, and think about creating, you know, it's kind of like Kate Rayworth says, you know, with her with her donut economics, she talks a lot about uh, regenerative and distributive networks, <laughs> you know, and, and really think about how we can create smaller entities that can join at, together and then form larger, more complex constructs. Mm -hmm. And if you need any better example of how, you know, small atomic you know, simple entities can be grouped together to create things of sublime complexity. I mean, just look at the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the main thing. I mean, rather than trying to architect these solutions from the top down, I think it's it's counterintuitive, but I think instead we need to really focus on, on building this new economy from the bottom up because we need to be able to maintain the integrity of the companies and the organizations that we're building. The mm -hmm. moment that that integrity gets, uh, you know, get, gets uh, lost, I mean, it, it's sort of almost impossible to be able to get that back again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so really, I think, you know, if we want to replace the uh, Facebook, we're not going to, we're not going to replace Facebook by building another Facebook, but instead we're going to replace Facebook by building a networked community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Raya, do you want to uh, add anything before we wrap up? No, I, I agree. I, I fully agree with uh, Melody. Uh, I just wanted to um, say that the, the idea of a, a post-growth capitalism mm -hmm. is nice, but I don't think we're there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, growing, growing these big, we always talk about scaling up and network effects, and this is about the growth, 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 and, and capitalism for, ever since its existence is about growth and expansion and expansion. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a coincidence that, you know, the big winners uh, of this big, big tech, you know, big tech monopolies are now trying to get into space and colonize Mars and what have you. Uh, this is the same logic as, as what was happening 500 years ago. Um, so both growth and this is a nice idea and maybe we are already in there i don't know um the, the rent seeking the the ways in which big techs are now sort of operating above the market uh, shaping markets um you know people talk about techno feudalism and other kinds of stuff uh the the, the rampant rentierism um but i don't i don't think we are there if you if you want to have a post-growth system then then i think because it's so fundamental to the ways in which capitalism has operated for the last five centuries mm -hmm. you you have to move into something beyond that um, but this is a nice discussion i could you know i think <laughs> it's the wrap up yeah i agree with you that we're not there <laughs> i mean we're barely starting <laughs> You yeah. know, but but I think that uh, you know, it, it, these, a lot of these are actually quite new discussions. I mean, you know, the mm -hmm. whole idea of how do we how how do we build companies that remove extraction? How do we build finance that removes the extraction? How do we use companies as a vehicle for degrowth? <laughs> you know, these kinds of questions, these are questions that really nobody has answered, uh, you know, and other things like steward owned companies, nonprofit companies, companies that cross subsidize uh, activistic or charitable activities. Mm. These are things that have barely been tried. So mm. I, you know, I, I'm not at the place where I'm going to be throwing up my hands and, and, and giving up <laughs> and saying, oh, we've tried it all and, and it hasn't worked. I think quite simply, you know, there's a spectrum of social enterprise from the commercial side to the not-for-profit side. I think the commercial side has been extremely well explored, and I think the not-for-profit not side, not so much. So I, I see a whole lot of space uh, for exploration, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to me that's a cause of optimism because I, I do believe that there is something that we have not really tried yet. Yeah. Thank you Perfect so much. <laughs> that is a great uh, optimistic ending. Um, 
Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in the art and culture sphere, we work a lot uh, in a not-for-profit model. Actually, we don't, uh, uh, it's um, it's often government subsidized, but uh, I think it's also really important what you're saying that uh, we also need to start imagining these new possibilities and these new potentialities that have not been explored yet. Um, so I just want to thank both of you for being here uh, and for uh, this conversation and also for sharing uh, your work uh, and your knowledge with us. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and also for being flexible moving online um, at the uh, last minute, uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna just give a few uh, more thank yous, a big thank you to our, uh, our audience who joined us tonight. Um, and uh, also, uh, well, I just mentioned government funding, but uh, thank you to the Stimulating Funds and the uh, AFCA who have been supporting the work that we do for many years and allow us to uh, put these events together and also have these important conversations. Um, for those of you who uh, are interested in staying up to date on uh, our upcoming events um, and uh, the research that we do, um, Lillian will share a link to our newsletter. You can sign up to it. Um, and we also have a Telegram channel uh, where we share um, articles and research related to internet and digital culture. Uh, every two weeks, we uh, publish a set of um, of, uh, of links for you to uh, look at over the weekend. Um, and uh, we also love to hear about your experience tonight. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, we're experimenting with different hybrid formats and structures. Um, and as part of this research, it's really important for us to also hear feedback uh, from you. Um, so you can uh, fill out our survey um, uh, and uh, I think there's a should be a QR code that maybe Marco can put up uh, for the survey, um, or Lillian will share the link to the survey in the chat. Um, all right, that's all. Yes, there it is. Uh, <laughs> you can scan that uh, if you uh, have time to uh, to take our survey. Um, that would be wonderful. And thank you again, everyone. Um, and uh, this is our last event for the year. Um, and we will be back again um, at the beginning of the new year, probably sometime in February or March. Uh, but uh, stay up to date in our newsletter and we'll, uh, we'll let you know when uh, our next event uh, will be happening. Thanks again and uh, have a wonderful night, everyone. Bye.